Welcome to EWTN Live, a program where we bring you guests from around the world. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and we are in the process of looking forward to Christmas coming up this Saturday. And we wanted to take time and wish our audience a very blessed Christmas. Remember that two years ago, we did a special Polish-themed Christmas show with a huge group of Polish singers from here in Birmingham and from Huntsville, Alabama. We talked about Polish Christmas traditions, food, and some favorite Polish Christmas carols. And one of our guests for tonight's show, Robert Rauhut from EWTN Germany, who happens to be part Polish and part German, was in the studio with me for that show two years ago. This year, COVID and travel restrictions associated with it have made it harder to do a show like that again. However, we very much wanted to move forward with a plan for a German-themed Christmas special for 2021. And we're happy to have joining us this evening from the headquarters of EWTN Germany in Cologne, Germany, our dear friends and colleagues, Martin Rothweiler and Robert Rauhut. Gentlemen, how are you? We are fine. I mean, Merry Christmas to everybody uh, as the Christmas is coming up. And yes, we are very fine here in Germany. I mean, we are a little bit under COVID restrictions uh, as in many yeah. parts of the world. But uh, this doesn't mean anything negative for us. We are happy and looking forward to Christmas. Yes. Frohe Weihnachten to you, Father Mitch, and to all <laughs> our viewers. Yes, exactly. That's the German word for Christmas, Weihnachten. Um, what is the origin of that word? Well, it, it means sacred night, and it comes probably also from the liturgy where we talk about the uh, Nox uh, Sancta. And I think this is uh, the, a literal translation. So it's the consecrated night, it's the sacred night, mm -hmm. and um, there's no, nothing, no word. I think this expression, I think it's from the uh, ninth century or uh, a little right of the medieval that it appeared for the first time. And usually uh, people are looking for older uh, pagan traditions, but there's no pagan tradition before no. that word. So this word is originally kind of a Christian word and we call it Weihnachten Nox Sancta. And it also reminds us naturally of the night uh, when Jesus Christ was born and the night, you know, the, the, the light that comes into the night is, I think, the main topic for this uh, name, Weihnachten in Germany, uh, as we call Christmas here. I know it strikes me as very odd at how frequently and usually incorrectly people try to connect Christmas with paganism. Uh, and uh, we will talk somewhat about that tonight. But one of the universal symbols of Christmas today is the Christmas tree. Even when I have been in Muslim countries like Egypt, for Christmas time, they set up Christmas trees, in, at least in public places like hotels and stuff. It's a symbol that is known around the world, uh, <laughs> including in countries that don't have any pine trees. Uh, I saw them in uh, Fiji. Uh, they, don't, they don't grow those there, but it, it's, it's universal and it comes from Germany. Tell us about the origin of the Christmas tree in uh, German tradition. All right. It comes from naturally a legend from, from Boniface. And maybe we can talk, both you know, uh, tell a little bit about it. It's Boniface is the apostle of Germany. He lived in the um, seventh century, born in England, and was sent uh, by the Pope to evangelize the Germanic tribes, if you want, so Germanic communities. 
and there was one um, Germanic community where they still sacrificed human beings, so they had human sacrifices there. And um, yeah, then one Christmas Eve, or the day before Christmas Eve, he went there to try to um, prevent this sacrifice to happen. And I don't know whether you want to continue no, the no, story, no, but go uh, on, were, go on, okay. Martin. Uh, it's fine. He, he wanted to prevent um, this, and um, it was everything took place under a sacred tree, a sacred uh, oak tree um, that this uh, uh, German tribe or German community uh, venerated. And he came one day before Christmas Eve there, and he really succeeded in preventing uh, the child that was supposed to be sacrificed uh, to be uh, killed. And um, so this was uh, the one first thing. Then he chopped off the oak tree. And everybody said because the oak tree was, I think, dedicated to the uh, god of thunder, at least the, the sacrifice was dedicated to, this, uh, oak, uh, to the god of thunder. And the oak tree was to, supposed to be a sacred tree. And uh, everybody said if someone does anything or will chop the, the, this tree, he will be killed or something bad will happen to him. But nothing bad happened to him. So. Um, this was kind of a kind of a miracle that he, with his uh, uh, pastoral stick, I don't know exactly what's the right expression for the for the stick that the bishop Staff. holds, he prevented uh, the hammer to you know to uh, to kill this little child, and the hammer was destroyed. So everybody was completely surprised by this miracle, and um, then I think uh, he still you know stayed there to evangelize. And then he, he pointed at one little small tree, which was a kind of an evergreen tree, a pine tree, and said, this is the new, uh, the, the new tree with its, with its evergreen uh, as a sign, with, as a tree of peace uh, in this wonderful night. And the, and the families and the communities should gather around uh, this, uh, this tree should um, be really, this, this tree will be a shelter for everybody. So this is from, from this moment on, as this tree, as a tree of, of, of shelter, as a tree of peace, if some, as a tree of care, for, as a sign for loving each other. And he said, in this night, no blood will be, will be shed because Jesus Christ is born. And I think this was the beginning and the source of the tradition uh, of the Christmas tree. And from that moment on, especially in Germany, uh, but naturally now all around the world, as you told us, the Christmas tree is the symbol, or is in the center nearly, in, in, each, in, in each and every home, not only in common places, but also in each and every home. And I think it's a wonderful symbol. And uh, yeah, it took um, the origin, the origin is, is uh, with, uh, connected to St. Boniface, the Apostle of Germany. Yeah, uh, St. Boniface. This is a very uh, specific uh, German uh, tradition, but it's also a reference to the tree in paradise, the paradise tree, which is the tree of life. And here we have the incarnation. So it's also symbolic for the uh, cross and Christ going to die on the cross. Also, this idea has been strongly present throughout the medieval ages and then later also in our times. Mm -hmm. Yes, St. Boniface had been made uh, an, uh, a bishop, an archbishop, and so he had that crozier, and that's what he used to, uh, to you know, stop the hammer. And, and the, the god uh, was Thor, was it not? Yes, it was Thor. It was the god of yeah. thunder, it was called, yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's odd that Thor has been revived as a comic book character uh, with his hammer. But uh, people forget about the role of human sacrifice among some of the various groups of German and Scandinavian people that worshipped him. Right. The, the, right. the other thing, too, with that is it's a tremendous substitute from sacrificing a child under Thor's oak tree to honoring the child Jesus under the evergreen. And that this is not a pagan symbol, but is the contrary sign, the, 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 the sign of contradiction that Simeon spoke of in the Gospel of St. Luke when Simeon spoke to the Blessed Mother in the, in the presentation 
in the temple. So that, that, this is a gift that the German Christian church has passed on to the rest of the world and we very much need that image. Yes, and, and that, that this tree is really an evergreen tree. I mean, green is a, is a sign of, became a sign of hope uh, and really a sign also of, also of, of um, eternal, uh, eternal life. Yes. And then later on, naturally, people started to decorate the trees, uh, and this has also a certain significance, not only with, um, with candles, like very late, but uh, before also with um, red apples, or now it will be kind of glass bowls like this. And these red apples and glass bowls as, as, um, are also already a hint that we are naturally, we are venerating this child, we are venerating someone who brought us the eternal life, but we are also thinking of the blood he shed for us on the cross. So these kind of red apples were also have also very deep uh, symbolic significance that may not be known by, by many people nowadays when they, no. when they buy these kind of de Christmas decorations. But uh, um, in the very beginning, and if one thinks and contemplates, I think the Christmas tree and its significance, then it's the eternal life, but it's also uh, showing us how Jesus, or uh, giving us a hint uh, that we venerate a child, but we venerate also the one who has uh, given his life for us. It also shows how and Christ is the new Adam and the Blessed Mother is the new Eve. The old Adam and old Eve took the fruit and sinned in the garden, but Christ, the new Adam and Mary, the new Eve, are there with that symbolic apple as a sign of the tree of life, as you mentioned. And this is also a very biblical image, not a, at all pagan. The, the right, other right. I mean, exactly with the candles also. The candles also as, a very, as an important symbol that, you know, were put on the, on, on the yes. trees. And, uh, and uh, which is also, I think, interesting uh, when you think of the, of the Christmas tree uh, in former times, um, it was naturally difficult to, to get a Christmas tree. And it's also, mm -hmm. um, in a terms of, um, yeah, funny may not be the right expression, but interesting to know that the Industrial Revolution, or at least, you know, the invention of the railway was very important for, this, for spreading the Christmas tree because then it could be transported into big cities like Berlin. So for people like living in the cities, small families uh, in homes, they didn't have a chance to have a Christmas tree at home, but um, together with this kind of um, industrial evolution or, or technical uh, evolution also, um, this made it possible to distribute or to, to, to spread the, the uh, Christmas tree also in the homes of the people. Uh, before mm -hmm. it was in big places on squares or in churches, but not in the homes of the people. So um, this is uh, also a way, you know, to where um, which are a reason for the for the far for the distribution or for the for spreading the Christmas tree. Really, uh, and it's really the place where the families gather around uh, on Christmas Eve, naturally together uh, with the nativity scene. As, as you mentioned, uh, the first places where we assume Christmas trees were used were the royal courts, the high courts, because it was expensive. And obviously kings, queens, emperors were able to organize such a festivity. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly hinted, the second stage was sort of the bourgeois family. This is also an image we often can see or observe where the family or the small family standing around the Christmas tree singing Christmas carols. And some of the first cities in Central Europe where this tradition was born were cities like Berlin, but also Munich, Vienna, Zurich. And from there it became popularized. You know, and one of the gifts that goes along with that is the very famous uh, German Christmas carol, O Tannenbaum. Um, what does tannen mean? Baum is a tree and tannen is? It's like you would say a pine tree, but they're different trees. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know whether we can specify it more better than saying it's, it's, it's a pine it's, tree. It's, it's a needle tree. Yeah. It's not a okay. leaf tree. It's a needle tree and it's uh, very characteristic for Central Europe, for Germany, Scandinavia. So it's something like an everyday symbol. It's very common to the people's imagination in yeah. this part of the world. We, 
we can play a little bit of that very famous carol. So let's take a listen to that. We know that song, and we, we sing it oftentimes in English, as we do a number of other German Christmas carols. I'd like to go to something that is connected with Christmas, but is especially connected with the city where you are, Köln, or as we usually call it from the French name, Cologne, Germany. Um, what is so special about Christmas in Cologne? I mean, the very special thing in Cologne that, that here we have the relics of the three magis, or three kings, as we say. So the Feast of Epiphany that is celebrated all over the world is here in Cologne, especially uh, celebrated as the, um, as the Feast of the Three Kings. And it's on the placed on the 6th of January, so the, usually it's the, the um, Feast of the Epiphany, and here we see the wonderful uh, shrine, golden shrine that was um, made for the relics when they came to uh, Germany, came to Cologne, uh, after Friedrich Barbarossa uh, conquered, um, so it was not a very peaceful thing, conquered Mailand and asked his chancellor, the Archbishop of Cologne, uh, to bring the uh, relics of the three uh, magis or the three kings uh, to Cologne. And this happened in the year, I think, 1164. Um, and uh, when they came to, to Cologne, there was naturally a, a big occasion, and it was even the reason for building the Cathedral of Cologne. So it, there's really a big history, and it's a big celebration there on the 6th uh, of January. And over the year, we have also pilgrimages. And if you remember uh, the World Youth Day 2005, it was all around, if you want, so this uh, relic or the relic of the three magis, uh, because uh, the, the title, the topic of it was uh, we are coming to adore him. So that's what the Magi's did. They adored Jesus Christ uh, in the manger, and uh, they gave these, as known, the three, pre the, the three presents of gold, uh, myrrh, and, and incense, which have a certain significance, a special significance. And you see details of the shrine, um, and which is interesting is uh, it doesn't say, tell anything about the story or the history of the three kings. Uh, yes, it has the scene of the adoration of the kings, but the rest is um, a narration of the life of Jesus. But it's the biggest and I think the yeah, most, most precious uh, shrine of the medieval. I mean, if you think of the 12th century that it was, it was built and uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was made, and um, then in the beginning of the, um, yeah, um, uh, in the, around medieval, the building, the construction of the, of the Cathedral of Cologne started, so it was built over uh, a couple of hundreds of years uh, until the, the, the way you see it today. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring out, too, that the celebration of the January 6th as the Epiphany, the 12th day of Christmas, from December 25th to the 6th, those are the 12 days of Christmas. And again, some people try to connect this with Roman pagan worship uh, but uh, of Saul Invictus, the unconquered son. But the reality is the feast of the unconquered son, Saul Invictus, was introduced into Rome in the 280s AD. And it was brought in as a response to the growing Christian church, 
celebrating the 25th as Christmas. It's not that Christmas was derived from the Roman feast. The Roman feast was in response to the Christian feast. And the reason the Christians chose the December 25th is that there, uh, in, they weren't sure of the precise year that Christ was crucified. And there were two options. One Passover was on a Friday on March 25th. And the other option was Passover on April 6th. And in the Eastern Church, they celebrated nine months after on January 6th. And in the Western Church, nine months after March 25th on December 25th. And so now we have both. And Cologne celebrates both of them. But it's rooted in the day they thought Christ had been crucified, not in Roman pagan religion. That's, that's nonsense. I think it's interesting also to have maybe two aspects of these two feasts, which I mean, belong yes. to, the, to the Christmas season, that, that you can say that on the 25th, we are focusing on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, you know, becoming, becoming man and, and with his birth. And on the, uh, during the, for the, uh, in this, uh, on the 6th of January, there may be the focus on the divinity, you know, uh, regarding the divinity of, of Christ. So the, his humanity and his divinity, uh, seeing also the gifts of the, uh, of the Magi. You know, when you think of the gold, honoring kind of the, the king of the universe, you think of the, uh, of the incense, which is a sign of venerating uh, a god, or we say also prayer, prayers, they go up to God, so it's something that has to do with the divine. And naturally the third symbol, the mirror, has to do again with the, with the suffering of Jesus Christ right. and pointing at his cross. So uh, you, you have these two uh, very important aspects, um, a true man and true God, uh, as uh, also in the, um, in the Council of Nicaea at the time, and very early, you know, in the fourth century, at uh, th uh, 325 after uh, Christmas, uh, after um, after Christ, um, was defined clearly. So, so I think these both feasts, you know, focus on yes. these on this wonderful mystery, and this great mystery, which is always a miracle. And I always think we we are in awe when you when you when you think, or just to try to think, or somehow perceive what 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 this means. You know, God becoming. Uh, man in Jesus Christ as a little child, and this little child is the you know has, has full fully God and fully man, um, and that's just a miracle. And every time you, I think we just um, it's it's hard to express it even in words. I mean you can you hardly we try to touch it with our words. I think, but um, it's 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 a wonderful mystery and and the greatest gift that that we can receive. The other thing I would bring out is that the Magi were Persian astrologers. And one of the aspects of Persian astrology is that they used gold, frankincense, and myrrh in the process of doing their various uh, work as astrologers and magicians. Magi is the origin of magician. And what's interesting to me is when people say, well, the Magi found Jesus because of astrology. Not quite. They found King Herod the Great because of astrology. The, the, the astrology led them to Herod, the murderer of babies. And it was the scripture when they got to Jerusalem that told them the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in Micah chapter 5. So they went to Bethlehem because of scripture. They went to Herod because of astrology. And then when they get to see Jesus, they give up the gold, frankincense, and myrrh they had used in their astrology. And they, they're giving up that practice when they see Christ, the true light. And then it has this other level of meaning for us Christians as well. 
as, exactly as you pointed out. So there's different levels of meaning with these wonderful gifts. Yes, right. I mean, there's, I think it's, it's when one digs into the deep, I think there's a lot of <laughs> things uh, that we can, can still discover um, uh, with the three kings. But I think especially, I think the veneration, the, the, the focusing on the divinity of, of, of Jesus Christ is something that, that, uh, that he's really uh, God and that they were led, you know, to this, uh, to this moment. I think this is, therefore, I think it's Epiphany because it's, uh, it's the feast that, because it's emperors, you know, they called Epiphany when they appeared in the public. Mm -hmm. So this was the Epiphany. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, therefore, I think still um, in, in, in some parts or in the Eastern, uh, in the Eastern Rite, um, this is kind of the Christmas, you know, yes. uh, especially in the Eastern Church, uh, right. still in, in many parts, and and also uh, things like traditions, like giving gifts. I think in Barcelona, even uh, I think in Spanish, there they usually uh, the gift giving is on the sixth of January, even. So in some parts uh, of the region, so it's uh, it's both, and it's 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 very interesting to have these two feasts uh, together and. Um, in earlier times, also the uh, Feast of the Epiphany, or maybe still today, was even uh, com combined, um, or the Epiphany of, 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 of the divinity of Christ uh, was kind of combined with uh, three feasts or three um, uh, mysteries, if you want. So the one is naturally the adoration of the, of the Magi, the other one um, is the baptism of, of Jesus uh, in the Jordan by Johannes, where he was kind of revealed the Son of, uh, the son of God as well as the miracle uh, at the wedding in Cana, where he revealed himself. Um, mm -hmm. So I think Epiphany, I think in earlier times, uh, these three feasts that we now celebrate separately were kind of celebrated <laughs> on one and the same day, if I'm not wrong. Yes, no, that, that's exactly right. Exactly right. And one of the, the this brings up uh, another um, uh, issue, we have a few minutes, you, in, in Germany, you make a distinction between St. Nicholas and uh, the, the Christmas gift giver. Tell us a little bit about Weihnachtsmann and St. Nicholas. If you want to... Uh, I, br I brought the two figures with us, I mean, St. Nicholas and, and the Weihnachtsmann, um, which are kind of in... Uh, it's a it's kind of a cultural clash between them <laughs> or a, a fight. Um, you see the Weihnachtsmann here, you know, which has no uh, insignia of a bishop, um, and um, this is naturally uh, obviously Saint Nicholas. I mean, I don't know whether you can uh, recognize it easily, but here you have the um, the um, uh, the uh, bishops, the the mitre. Uh, you have naturally the um, the rope, uh, um, or the choir rope, etc., and all the and, and the cross uh, of a bishop. So these t people are, let me put it that way, like fighting um, with each other, um, not only in the market, in the chocolate market. And it's funny, um, I mean, before explaining it a little bit more and together with, with Robert, that um, a charity also, a German uh, charity, which is owned by the, by the Bishops' Conference or the, by the German Church, which is called Bonifatius Werk, they are campaigning for a um, Weihnachtsmann free zone, you would say in St. Nicholas free, free zone, trying to sell um, these uh, things more and naturally for good purposes. But this is kind of a, really a, a difference between, and um, that's a development naturally, um, on the feast of St. Nicholas at first, that um, St. Nicholas was, um, uh, because of the history of St. Nicholas, was a special day also for um, uh, giving gifts uh, to children uh, after a while, because he was uh, that is linked to the miracles uh, that he, um, that, that uh, I think uh, that uh, St. Nicholas gave, uh, uh, that Nicholas uh, completed. This means the one is the miracle with the, I think we see it here, probably this is probably with the three virgins, mm -hmm. um, where St. Nicholas put golden, app uh, uh, put golden apples into the house because these three virgins um, uh, were running the danger of being exposed to prostitution because her father, their father, was so poor that he was not uh, able to offer a, a dowry um, so that they could marry. So this was one of the miracles that he um, uh, fulfilled. And another miracle was also a, the uh, awakening of three young uh, boys um, that were uh, killed by uh, an innkeeper 
Uh, so he was known for being something good for kids, someone who loves kids, not only in this regard, but, but also someone who, is, who loves the kids and kind of a gift giver um, at the same time. So this is the reputation of St. Nicholas. And therefore on St. Nicholas' feast, um, usually, you know, kids or at, at, at the beginning, even the poor people got a certain present uh, at that day. And then there's a tradition of the shoes putting out, um, you know, uh, so that you could put the shoes out, that, that you get some presents. Uh, you know, from St. Nicholas. But this tradition then uh, moved, and this has to do with the Reformation, uh, yeah, with, indeed. with uh, Martin Luther, who forbid at the one time, because they, they don't see anymore the saints as mediators. You know, for, uh, and so this is, uh, if you want to continue that story, yeah, sure. um, um, this, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the uh, changed everything. In yeah, as, as you rightly pointed out, the reason for this uh, development was that the Protestants churches, they don't have the saints. They reject that part of our tradition and faith. So um, uh, Martin Luther was sort of looking for a substitute and he has a very Christocentric perspective. So he said uh, that we have to focus or concentrate on the figure of Jesus Christ, of the Christ child. And with this focus or concentration, within the Protestant tradition in uh, Germany, by time also all aspects or many aspects connected with St. Nicholas Day moved to the Christmas Day, to the 24th. And so now it was less St. Nicholas, but much more the Christ child, which was bringing the presents to the people, to the families, to the children. And this tradition developed and since then it has stayed like that. And it obviously has also influenced the uh, Catholic uh, Church and the Catholic communities which have taken it over. So right, but, but still in the Netherlands, I think it's still kept as the feast day yes. and is the, is the day where the kids are receiving or the gifts of the gift giving day, if you want so. And, and, the, and from the Netherlands, uh, St. Nicholas came, uh, came abroad, you know, went to the New World. Uh, and was accepted there. And then I think the mixture started a little bit. So, it, it, so St. Nicholas was exported to the New World, uh, but the day of the, of, of the giving of the, th uh, of the gifts were already moved to, to Christmas. And, and I think then a change of a, a kind of secularization fo followed. And then as we you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, the insignia, you know, he left all the insignia of, a, of being a bishop and then uh, came, became St. Nicholas um, uh, over the time. And this St. Nicholas then was re-imported <laughs> to Europe and, uh, to, and to Germany. And uh, this is probably the origin of the Weihnachtsman and the origin of this um, yeah, cultural clash between these two guys here. <laughs> and um, yeah, between Bishop St. Nicholas and the Weihnachtsmann, as we call him here. Yeah. Uh, well, what we also have, in, as you pointed out, in these uh, traditions is that um, when we have in uh, Germany, we have this figure of Knecht Ruprecht, which would be sort of the company man or assistant of St. Nicholas and who would be usually responsible for punishment. So there is also this uh, saying or this tradition which says that the Weihnachtsmann later on was sort of a merger between St. Nicholas and the other guy. So that's why we have this uh, purely Catholic, I would say, St. Nicholas, and then the uh, other sort of cloned figure, which uh, has gained this popularity because, yeah, I would say also of mass media and promotion. It's also a promotional movement. But in Germany, we have these um, charity organization, uh, St. Boniface Works, and a couple of years ago, they started this uh, uh, tradition you also mentioned that they sort of want to remind people again of the story and the idea behind St. Nicholas and to make this Christian aspect of Advent and Christmas uh, more here in the public. And from what I remember they have been very successful yeah. in uh, reaching many people with this idea. Indeed, it's a good campaign. I heard about the Netherlands even that there are certain mayors also that uh, want to have kind of a, uh, a, Saint Nic a Santa Claus free zone, etc. I mean, so the same, yeah, let me say, fight or, st or, st or struggle is going on. Then naturally, something is, is also in their 
I think in their world, sometimes natural is also uh, in terms of uh, things of marketing. But as you mentioned rightly, uh, Robert, it's about bringing back the real significance of St. Nicholas. And I yeah. remember when I was a child, because I have grown up on the border to the Netherlands, we used to go on St. Nicholas Day over to the Netherlands because you have something like a carnival there. It's a big uh, movement with, with cars, with music, with St. Nicholas going and, you know, they are throwing sweets. It's a bit like carnival mm -hmm. in Germany. So this has been quite popular there and it's a really big event. Well, I'm very familiar with the part where the bad kids get a piece of coal. <laughs> and now it's so bad that the environmentalists won't even let me get the coal. They just put rocks in my shoes. So <laughs> this is the way it goes. Look, we need to take a break. And we'll come back in a couple of minutes. Uh, urge all of our audience, especially those who speak some German, to go to EWTN Germany on the Internet. You can find it at EWTN.de for Deutschland. Uh, EWTN.de. Please stay with us and we'll continue on, especially talking about German Christmas carols. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We are talking with Robert Rauhut and Martin Rotweiler, who are in our EWTN Germany uh, studios uh, in Cologne, Germany. Uh, and we're discussing some aspects of a German Christmas. And Robert, when uh, we made the program about the Polish Christmas, um, we, we talk about how you straddle both sides because you're, you're part Polish, part German, and you grew up with both traditions. Uh, yeah, and you're very familiar with both languages and both traditions. Um, and you gave some very interesting insights into German Christmas carols. I'd like you to discuss some of those characteristics of the German carols. Uh, when we take a closer look at the German uh, carols, they are very much situated in a special image we have of Christmas. It's the snowy landscapes, it's a cold, dark weather night outside, and we have these people around the fire giving warmth, so there, there's a lot of play with light and with darkness, but also this very humble, but at the same time very festive atmosphere, which shines through most of the German carols. The most famous one, obviously, is uh, Holy Night, Silent Night, and but also the one we heard before, although it's a more secular one, O Tannenbaum, it's very much reflecting, creating a very special atmosphere. And I think this is also a sort of inculturation of it, because when we are in other parts of the world, obviously people know less about snow and about, you know, the, uh, the trees and things which are very specific for our region. So th it gives this exotic moment, but it's sort of also a bit strange foreign. Whereas for people who have grown up in these areas, it's all very familiar. We know it. I have to confess, snow, there has been less and less snow around the last couple of years. They now say every 10 years we are going to have a snowy white Christmas in Germany or most parts of Germany. But for a very long time, this has been a common and created image. And obviously the uh, traditions which are taken up in the 
German uh, carols, they are much, much older. I suppose the origins are in the Liturgy of the Hours, the first we have, and uh, later on they are taken up. They are also Germanized. The songs or the hymns we have were in Latin. Then they become German, they become sort of localized, they become in culturalized, and from there on more and more of a sort of, we call it lead good, uh, sort of local history of uh, church music developed, we're culminating in the 19th century with uh, Holy Night, Silent Night, but we have many, many other carols. I mean, the, the German carols we have, there are hundreds, thousands even, I would say, nowadays around. But we also have other traditions. We have secular traditions like O. Tannenbaum, which have been taken up and sort of incorporated in what we call the uh, carol singing. And there has been also always this distinction between the Advent songs, which are also a bit, I would say, calmer, more preparative. They sort of prepare us for the mystery of God becoming man in Christ. So there is this atmosphere of expectation. We have the light, the Rorate Mass, where we sort of all prepare for the big saint days to come. And then when we have uh, the, uh, the 6th of January, which, which, which is one of the dates where sort of Christmas terminates with the three Magi with Epiphany, or on the uh, Sunday after Epiphany, which is uh, the baptism of the Lord, these traditions sort of become more silent. They sort of died down l slowly, lately. Uh, the latest being beginning of February and a uh, Marian feast we have. But you will still see or hear these uh, songs being uh, sung also in the liturgy, because that, that's the central place from where it originated. It, it's been the liturgy where these songs developed, and after that they spread into houses, into families, into the smaller communities. Mm -hmm. Interesting is, I mean, historically, that one says that even, I mean, which has nothing to do with, you know, the German Christmas carols, but that in terms of special Christmas songs, yeah. they even derived from Egypt in the yeah. early, uh, in the 300, around the 300s, uh, at, the, at least according to the sources, uh, I think there's a, a script or something, at least a document, that proves um, Christmas songs, if you, if you want so, but it was naturally a choir or was kind of a dialogue um, a song, you know, in, in Egypt uh, around the 300, which is, I think, most interesting. Also, to have, like, when, when, we, when you, you mentioned the liturgy, um, that uh, Pope Liberius, uh, I think in the also around 300 and, and something, um, there was the first Christmas sermon, uh, so that uh, as a proof that uh, Christmas was celebrated very early on the 25th. But um, again, the liturgy is really the, the source, as you said, uh, for the songs or the tradition of the Christmas carols in Germany. There, there is also a little connection with, uh, we hinted at it when we were talking about the Reformation, because as we may remember, a part of the success of the Reformation was that they sort of translated the Latin text into the German language. So a challenge for the Catholic communities in the Reformation time was the Protestants were singing a lot in the German language. And that was highly attractive. And it was pulling people because people loved singing. So the uh, Catholics, they saw this challenge, and that's also a time where many Catholic carol songs developed, also as a counter sort of reaction to it, to, to get people back into the Catholic uh, churches. And uh, so this is another reason why these traditions are so strong in the German-speaking world. And we should also not forget that these songs, today they are songs which are sung by many people, not only Christians, maybe people who have been sort of culturalized Christian or baptized, but not active Christians anymore. But if they know any songs in the language, in German, it will be the 
Christmas carols, they will know it. They, it's so strongly in the German culture. And we also know when we take, for instance, Eastern Germany, um, we know that when we had the DDR and the communist regime, they knew that uh, Christmas does have an attraction to the people. So they thought of, were looking for a substitute for Christmas and they sort of tried to put the emphasis on something else, which was uh, that Christmas is sort of a feast of peace, of solidarity, less about the theological or spiritual aspect. And for that reason, they also tried to create this secular Christmas songs, which have been far less successful than ours. This is one of the things about communist art in general. It's usually, almost always, cheap junk. Uh, I remember seeing photographs at the end of communism that there were big uh, scrap yards, junk yards, full of statues of Marx and Lenin that they were selling to Meltdown because their art was bad and it showed up in their poor music. Uh, Martin, you mentioned something about the Egyptian Christmas hymns around the year 300. It's also in Egypt that they had figured out that it was either the 25th of December or the 6th of January, and they were celebrating Christmas in Egypt in the 100s AD, more than 100 years before the Romans ever celebrated Sol Invictus. So Egypt is uh, very much a source for some of this. And I suspect it's because they had such a large Jewish community that could help to inform the local Christians about these things. And the Egyptians also were great hymn singers. Uh, they, they, they passed on a number of hymns around the ancient world. Um, it's amazing to me that in Germany that, that sense of singing uh, in public songs that everybody knows it is still somewhat part of the culture. We're losing it here in America. We used to have it when I was a kid, and we're losing it because the media does the singing for us the way that athletes do all the hard work and sports for us, and we just watch. Whereas the singing of the Christmas hymns ought to be something the whole community can join in and take part in. That's a very important element. Yeah, I think it, it characterizes usually also, I think, the Christmas Eve in families that you come to when you come together. I mean, that's in our family, for example. Uh, you enter the room, someone is ringing the bell, um, the father of the family is reading the gospel at first. No, in, in, in first, we first sing a Christmas uh, carol to, to Bethlehem Geboren, for example. And then um, I'm reading, or the father of the family uh, is reading the gospel uh, of the uh, nativity of, of Jesus Christ, of the, of the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, and then uh, we again sing together uh, Christmas, several Christmas carols. And if someone is kind of uh, has an instrument, a trumpet or a trombone, like in our case, or a guitar, then we really try to do music at least for um, yeah, 10, 15 minutes or uh, even not longer. And love this really very much before in our home we start to have a coffee. That's actually when, when, when um, it has become dark and uh, when the kids were, uh, were little. So we first had the coffee and then there was the exchanging of the gifts for the kids and then we have the evening, um, uh, the dinner, a uh, dinner and then went to mass. But really so in families, and I think it's still in case in many Catholic families, the, to sing Christmas carols is an essential part of your Christmas Eve uh, celebration. And when you mentioned Egypt, what I always really think is always fascinating is how we can trace back the, our traditions in so early times. You know, in, in the in the in the early uh, in, 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 into early Christianity, what ha what happens? You know, when when we think of the story in Origenes, who said, for example, when we talk about the the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem. That, they, that he, I think, mentions something like 
If you can, you can ask everybody in Bethlehem, uh, and he will tell you uh, where the cave was, where Jesus Christ was born. So I think it's always very impressive how these traditions go on and how they really can be traced back into the very early times of Christianity. Also, it's interesting to note, you uh, as I say, it's interesting to note that in Origen's lifetime, the cave was covered over by a pagan temple to Adonis to discourage Christians from coming there, but they still knew exactly where it was. And they just passed that on as a tradition. And uh, when St. Helena came, they found a manger in there. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, I think an, an aspect which is still to be discovered in the 21st century, although it's been present all the time, is the performative aspect of uh, living the traditions. Uh, the, we usually have this idea that we think, thought of, okay, there is Christmas, there is this information about it, and then people will usually go, is it true, is it not true, what is true about it? But this already takes you in a sort of uh, yeah street with a dead end, because when we look at it, how faith is living is by being performed in the liturgy. It's by, it's not only that we are bringing in information, it's by what we do. And this part of doing, singing the Christmas carols, going to the church services, they seem to be extremely essential for a vivid and a live faith and also for community building. And I think part of secular philosophy also in the 21st century is rediscovering this aspect and how much important it is for communities to live and to flourish. And I think uh, this is something we have in our church and when we rediscover it, 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 it does have its effect on the society as a whole. Extremely powerful effect. Yep. I think in this country, I don't know Germany, but in this country, um, church is one of the last places that people still sing together in public. And it's, uh, it doesn't happen very often in other places anymore. I, I would like us yeah, in, to... In, in Germany, it's very popular. Yeah. That's in good. Germany, it's very popular. I remember when I used to live in Berlin, people would congregate in public places during Christmas, Advent time, and they will sing together. And it's hundreds or thousands of people coming together. And you also have it in our parishes, you know. Yeah. You have lots of concert choirs, but you also have, uh, you know, sort of carol singing in parishes. I know one parish in Aachen where they do it usually on the second day because we have Christmas Eve, and then we have two days, and the second day is where they will come together, bring their instruments, and then there you will have 200, 300 people singing together in the church. It's uh, a lovely and experience. And during Advent time, we, we live transmit a, a big Advent concert, so to speak, where people are invited to come into the Cologne Cathedral uh, to perform Advent songs. And these Advent songs, and it's so attractive. People come with their violins, they come with their trumpets, and they sing, yes. and they're guided by, by a fairly famous you know, band. And, uh, and then they sing Christmas songs together, and it's so attractive. And I think two or th no, three years ago, maybe before Corona, there was even a full stadium uh, of the Cologne football stadium that was filled with people. Maybe not always convinced Christians, but at least they liked and loved it to sing together these Advent or Christmas songs uh, at that time and we transmitted it live as well. So really uh, to come together, to join and to sing together is really something essential that we Germans uh, love very much so. Yeah, the, the same is true in Poland and a few other places and we need to encourage these examples to be spread. But one of the sad things about this is that we are simply running out of time I, I regret that very much, but it has been a delight. Uh, again, I want to encourage all of our global viewers to go to EWTN.de, EWTN Deutschland. I want to thank you, Martin and Robert, for being with us tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. And what we will do, uh, instead of my usual music, we'll end with uh, Silent Night in German. Thank you both very, very much.